welcome to the lake. I live on Lake Conroe and this video is going to be about making a custom lampshade and the different steps that we went through working with a good friend. Probably the most important part was that we listened to each other and we figured out a solution in the end that made them both very happy. Hope this video gives you some idea of what's involved in my process and thanks for stopping by. As artists, we all like to work with our friends. And a good friend of mine came by and said, Hey, uh, I had a lampshade break. Could you make one? I know you work in glass. And could I work with you? And I said, Sure. This sounds like a fun project. Not quite sure how we're going to make it, but we'll figure it out. So this is what he presented me with. A wire frame and a little piece of glass that was a remnant of what was broken on the inside. You can see that the wire frame fit on the outside and the glass was on the inside. So this is Larry. He's a great guy. He's a super neighbor and his wife Lynn. They live just around the corner from us. He's an airline pilot as well as an educator. A lot of fun, really smart guy always up for a challenge and a great gardener. So here we go. We had to design a blank. Larry had never worked in glass. So I showed him how I oftentimes lay blanks out. We took a piece of paper. We came up with some organic designs that we could uh, trace onto the paper after I'd cut out a 22 inch circle of Tecta glass. So that was our base. So we had the Tecta underneath. Then we took some um, Egyptian blue streaky glass and we cut that up into uh, organic shapes that we could lay out. We added two frits to this. We added some medium amber fine and also added some uh, opaline striker coarse to give a little bit of texture and depth. So Larry got a spoon out and we started placing the fret in between our pieces that we had cut out of the blue streaky. So we got this into the kiln. Uh, we cleaned up the edges and uh, it was ready to fire. It was fired on a sheet of thin fire paper. It fired beautifully. Nice texture, good depth, little irregular edges. I offered to trim those off, but Larry said, no, I like the irregularity. So we moved on to the next step. How in the world were we going to slump this into a big mold that wasn't made? As an artist, you're always dealing with challenges. So you go to people that can help you. I have several groups on Facebook that have good support groups. One is Bullseye. And I was told that I could make a low-fire ceramic mold, so I contacted an artist friend of mine who does ceramics, and she talked to me about getting uh, some bee mix with grog, but that was going to take a long time to dry and form a mold. My next step was uh, to present on a Saturday Sherlocking an episode of Lunch with a Glass Artist, and at that time I met Barbara Cashman. So I was lucky to meet Barbara Cashman. She happened to come to this uh, lunch presentation that I did and told me about her silk mat. Uh, contacted her, looked at her website, looked at her videos, and uh, learned a lot. Said, let's give it a try. So after talking to Barbara, I ordered a couple sheets of silk mat and the rigidizer. It comes in 24 by 24 sheets. They were a smidge over 24 when I got them. She said to pre-fire them to be sure they didn't shrink. So that's what I did. They went from about 24 and 3 eighths. <clears throat> and then when they were fired, they went down to uh, 23 inches. So there was significant shrinkage. Uh, once these were fired in the kiln, uh, the next step was to apply the rigidizer. In her video, she said that you may not need to apply this to both sides, but since this was something new for me, I applied it to both sides because I had a really deep drop 
First thing I did was coat the wire mold with some blue painter's tape. Once that painter's tape was on, I uh, sprayed it with some Pam as a release and that worked great. Uh, once that was done, uh, then it was draped over this mold. I would used some clamps to take up a pleat to get it to fit the mold. Uh, this took a lot of rigidizers. rigidizer. Next I was in uncharted territory because I had this very deep drop and I didn't want these pleats to open so I fabricated some leftover pieces of stainless with some bolts to make some permanent clamps that held those from uh, uh, not opening up during the firing. Next I fired the mold to harden it. When that was done, uh, the mold got a lot more rigidity. But you can see on the top there's some open areas. Talked to Larry about this, and he decided that he wanted to keep the full size of the glass or not cut a piece to fit the interior part of the mold. So then the question was how do we support that outer rim of glass so when you slump it, it doesn't fall through those holes. So we bought another piece of silk mat and made a donut. Once that donut was made, we sprayed the mold again uh, with Pam. Uh, this works great as a release agent. And then what we did was we added rigidizer uh, to set the mold up and dry. Um, Larry helped me a lot during these stages. So the rigidizer took a fair amount. We ended up using almost four quarts. Maybe it was our first time we used too much, but we wanted to be liberal so that it would try and hold together. I held this down to the mold uh, with some glass, and we let this sit for about three days till it fully hardened up. The mold just popped out. It was easy. Then I used a whip stitch with some stainless steel thread that I had bought from Barbara to sew around the inner edges of that uh, donut so that it wouldn't pop loose during firing. It's pretty easy to do this. And uh, once they were uh, coated with thin fire, uh, excuse me, with shelf primer, uh, they uh, pretty much went away. So there's the mold. Uh, refired it again to harden all this. When I refired it, I was just curious what would happen during uh, the ramp up phase of this refiring. I had this on kiln posts all the way around and a little bit of support to raise it off the bottom so the heat could get all around it. And when I opened the kiln up somewhere around 500 degrees, there was some discoloration, but once it was uh, fully fired that all went away. It's just interesting to know it'll change colors on you. So the next thing I did was apply uh, shelf primer and I fired that to 500 degrees to make sure there was a water left in that. In her videos she talks about you may not have to use shelf primer but if you have any opalescent glass it may stick so I use shelf primer. Next step the process was to level the mold out and get ready to have a big slump. So I read through several different manuals on temperatures to slump this big of an object. I've done a lot of uh, drop ring molds and they actually start dropping around a thousand degrees. So I uh, went back to my resources on Facebook, found a good uh, model and set it up to fire. I happened to see a post on someone who had replied to uh, one of my posts who said she had the exact same kiln and fired sinks and used this firing schedule to work great. I tend to fire my slumps very low uh, as Bob Leatherman has recommended so that you keep the texture on both sides and you can control your slump. So I set the kiln up uh, such that I had three different temperatures, 115, 1, 1150, and 1180. And you can see that 
I used the higher temp just for about 10 minutes because it was almost midnight and I needed to go to bed. So this is how it slumped. Um, this was the first stages around 1100 degrees. Um, this was the hold after the hour hold. Then uh, at 1122 it starts moving. You can see how the glass shrinks in just a bit from the outer edges of the mold like we had expected but it didn't fully all pull down which is what we hoped would happen. Finished the slump about 11 o'clock at night and we uh, ended up with a beautiful uh, slump bowl. Had a nice uh, surface on the outside as well as a wonderful surface underneath. We picked up just a small amount of texture just on the rim. Uh, the slump was almost seven inches deep, six and a half thereabouts. And uh, when that was complete, we then were uh, faced with how are we going to mount this to the lamp itself. Uh, we slumped this bowl over a mold with the wire on the inside. But to support it on the lamp, we needed the wire on the outside. So next step, we drilled a hole. Uh, Larry bought some diamond bits uh, on a very low speed and going very slowly. Uh, we drilled through the bottom, did it in two different stages. Um, again, you have to hold the drill fairly secure with both hands. We placed it on the floor with some towels underneath so when the water went out, it didn't go all over everything. After drilling through that, um, we had a beautiful hole and um, oh. it was just a little bit of um, Thank you, glass gods. shards that needed to be cleaned up. Oh, wait, wait. So once we got this hole done, the next step was to uh, move out to my uh, wet area in my studio where I have a uh, flat lap machine. So a 12 inch Covington flat lap with some diamond cones that work great for finishing edges. And it worked great for uh, trimming off this interior portion. You need to make sure that the cone doesn't get stuck. So you don't want to push it all the way down and go gradually on the sides. Just trim the cone up nice uh, to a nice smooth rim. And uh, I think Larry was more excited about this than I was because I've done this several times before. So the next step was to figure out how to get this mold on the outside rather than the inside. So what we had to do is refabricate it. So we had to cut each portion of the outer rim, put some new metal in there which I welded in place. We also welded a base in there because the support that he had prior would have only uh, held the glass on a quarter inch rim and that uh, was too big a piece of glass and that would have broken. So I had a nice base um, and we rebuilt the lamp. And we got the uh, wires redone, base redone. We bolted on this steel plate at the bottom to the top of the lamp. And then it was time to apply some silicone and glue this top on. I've used this uh, GE silicone that's 100% uh, as a uh, way to put glass together. It has excellent adhesion and works great. We leveled the glass and we taped it so that it wouldn't move as the uh, silicone adhesive dried. So it was fun to see the lamp as it emerged when we took the tape off. Beautiful, beautiful shape and contour. Metal shape now fit on the outside and the uh, base all work nicely together. Uh, we were looking for a way to light it up and we found actually a light bulb with some metal on the outside. And that was a great addition and uh, formed a great uh, light from our friends. So what I'd say it was a wonderful project with a great friend. It took us about a month of different steps and drying stages. But once it was delivered to their home, Larry sent me this wonderful picture at night uh, with a big smile. This was a great project. It's a lot of fun. It took a little scratching our heads to make sure that it all worked out, but in the end it worked out great. 
Hey, thanks for your time. This was a great project with a good friend. I'm glad this turned out so well. I appreciate the wonderful artist community, which gave us a lot of support and suggestions as we went along. My website is www.alhelmanart. I do a lot of glass work. I'm a metalsmith, goldsmith, and I have an enameling and art degree from Glassell School of Art. My Instagram logon is alhelmanart.com. Again, thank you for your time. Hopefully this gave you a little bit of a sneak into what it takes to make a custom commission and work with a client so we both get perfect results together. Again, till we meet again, thanks again. Bye.